Great. Um, so good afternoon, everyone, and, and welcome to the Learning Disabilities Awareness Club's uh, Profcast series. Uh, my name is Marcus Nandu. I'm a third year kin student or incoming fourth year kin student, and um, I will be today's host. Our special guest today is Dr. Carla Silva. Hi, everybody. Thank you for, um, oh, it always translates as silver. So Silva is a Portuguese name. The ones of you who like uh, soccer uh, or football um, for other cultures will know this name because there are lots of players with the name Silva. Oh, yeah. So it ends in name. But yeah, it's nice. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I, I love talking to students. And, and um, um, yeah, let's have a chat. So first, we'll just uh, get started. Tell us a little bit about you, what city you're from, and what teaches you, or what courses you teach at Western. Um, okay, so I do have a few PowerPoints, um, a few slides. Uh, okay, now it's where I need some help because I forgot. Oh, share screen. There it is. Okay, I got it. Let me just hide that here. Okay, so um, PowerPoint there. Um, okay, so um, yes, yeah, so I am Portuguese, as I mentioned before, um, more specifically from Lisbon. So I had to bring a few pictures, um, very, very different physical and cultural environments from what we have in Canada. You can just notice by the proximity of the houses, right? So if you need a cup of sugar, you can just tell us, hey, and you have four or five, four or five neighbors just coming um, in your help. And um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's my home. It's um, my heart is definitely there. Um, really, really interesting uh, place to grow up. Um, also, there's another side. Lisbon is has a river, uh, but it's located where the sea starts, just there. Um, and so, yes, the sea was fundamental. It's fundamental in my experience, my life experience. I spent. I don't know how to surf, unfortunately. I don't like things that move quickly. I'm not very good at them. But I played uh, many, many, many hours of, of uh, beach volleyball, which was which was my sport of election. Yeah, I'll stop sharing for a moment. I hope you like the pictures and you feel like going there when this is all over. Portugal is one of my places on my, my bucket list I have to go to. I'll be uh, sure to stop into Lisbon. Uh, Portuguese people love to receive tourists. Uh, it's also, if you're Canadian, um, it's also very cheap. To be honest, you know, a coffee there costs 65 cents, which is um, less than a dollar. Um, yes, and I could give you a reference for a beer, a small beer. Let me see. That would be, um, yeah, around three dollars, maybe a bit less. Yeah, you should go. <laughs> Definitely. Um, what courses do you teach at Western? Um, so I'm teaching uh, sports coaching, uh, not exactly my area of expertise, but uh, I was a coach uh, for many years and, and uh, I did a sports degree as well. Um, and I taught sports coaching at other universities. Um, and I'm teaching also other more social cultural courses, which is my area of expertise. Um, a new course coming up that is cross listed with health studies is called Disability and the Moving Body. It's a, I can't remember which, whether it's just fourth year or it's third and fourth. Uh, can't remember that, but teaching that too. Uh, I taught qualitative research methods that has for two years that has been discontinued. Uh, it might come back. And I teach, uh, I taught the practicum, which I'm not teaching last year. And um, I teach a very special course in health studies. Uh, it was called, um, until the end of this year, determinant social, uh, 
sorry, determinants of health and disease. And I tell the students they're all social because no individual exists outside of a social context. So, but it's going to be renamed actually to, um, because the key concept of that course is intellectual empathy. So for people who take courses with me, they, they know that I put a lot of emphasis in developing the skills to connect with others on a meaningful level. So intellectual empathy is all about that. And it's all about understand diversity a bit better and, and really develop the ability to accept everyone. So it's going to be called Intellectual Empathy for Health Justice. Um, but that is um, as far as I, no, sorry, I was going to say it's just for health studies students, but actually that's wrong. So if, you know, primarily for health studies, if uh, um, the, um, it's capped at 60 students. So if there's not enough interest, then other students can, can, can enroll. Yeah. Um, so I put, I put the name of one of the courses in the chat. I, I tried to keep up with the rest. It, it didn't happen, but um, for our viewers out there, make sure you check that out and uh, we'll see you in Carla's class can, come I September. Can, I can write it. And also, uh, I appreciate Shannon, your comments. So I have the chat open. Um, I really, yeah, so please ask your questions and interact with me using the chat for sure. Okay, or even interrupting. I think this is supposed to be informal, right, Marcus? Yes. So I, I don't mind if you interrupt. I don't have a kind of a lecture. That's not my style anyway, but so feel you can free to, interrupt. Sorry, feel free to just either raise your hand or just unmute and Go for it if you have any questions throughout our, our chat here. Um, but uh, you taught a lot of courses this year and you, you've taught many courses previously. So how did you find the, the online format this year as opposed to your previous experiences? Um, I actually like it. <laughs> so I know it was hard for the students. Um, I, I like technology and I like to try different things. And, and yes, it was a lot of work during the summer trying to learn specialty teams. But I, I found that I, I got to know my students better, actually. So you know how in class, you have to have a certain personality to interact and to kind of offer your opinion. And um, the online environment gives so many different outlets for people to participate. So it covers a diversity of personalities. You know, even if you're very shy, you can still write in the chat. Um, and um, yeah, I, I like it. Um, I, I, I would like to go back, and that's what I'm doing in my courses, go back to some in-person teaching for sure. But I'm going to um, try a blended approach from now, now on. So part is online and then uh, part of the course is in person. Yeah, for sure. I think I think there's definitely a, a blend of, of what the the online platform would offer to students in terms of, you know, accommodating their personal choices and participating. And um, obviously, the in person is, is a different experience as well. Right. So I think, I think that will for sure help students feel more comfortable participating. Yes. Can, can we hear some opinions from from people who are maybe around? Um, um, and also, I kind of there, there's a, a real danger for students there and for professors too, which is you don't have a regular routine, you don't have a schedule. And I know many of the students are working, so you know when you're working, it's it you have to be extra disciplined and you have to be, um, you know, like I do every day. I get up, <laughs> I say eight to five is just work. Eight to five is just work. And I have to say this to myself because the temptations are many, right? You have your phone, you're on the computer, you say, oh, I love to shop those sneakers. I, I know I just, and then you go. And, and that is a real danger for every professional, really working, you know, when you have Wi-Fi or turn off the Wi-Fi, the Wi-Fi or just find strategies because um, time management and you know self-regulation is so important and um, I'm saying this 
from the, the perspective of somebody who's excited about every single little thing in the world. So, you know, I just, ah, that's amazing. So I, I know that it's hard. Yes, for sure. It, it, I, it, I, for one, found, sorry, um, I, for one, found it kind of difficult at first to adjust to the online environment. Um, just in terms of, you know, a lot of people find it easier to be on campus. You have a set routine, you know, you're walking to class, you're, you're in class, you participate. Whereas at home, you can be, I'm like two feet from my bed. So it's very easy to get caught up with, you know, not only cellular distractions, you know, being on the internet, but also being in a different environment completely, right? So it, for, I, for one, found it of a, a bit of a more difficult transition, especially some classes don't have the, the synchronous environment, some are asynchronous. So it is a bit of a, a mush for me, at least, but I'd like to hear how any of you guys thought the, the online environment was for you this year, if you would like to share. Um, yes, and I'm just going to continue to speak so that people, you know, you can step in and you can use the chat, but so that it doesn't feel um, awkward. But, you know, we, we also developed, we are all very tired of this situation, but we also have to see the silver linings. It's, it's kind of what skills, what abilities, what new ways of, of looking at work and, and so on did you develop because you have to. Um, I see a few. I'm very fortunate, actually. I'm privileged in that I can come to the office, which is very close from home. So that helps a lot. I think you're right. If you can identify a space in your house, which is not always possible to just work, that helps a lot because it's, it's kind of a mindset. You get in and you know, you know, and you eliminate all distractions. You close the door, you let the dog out, you know, um, and yeah. But, but I'm privileged in that way that, that I can come to the office. So I do that, yeah. For sure, for sure. I think, you know, we're talking about silver linings and I think moving forward, um, hopefully this coming year, if we have more of an, the mixed kind of format you were talking about earlier, will definitely be, you know, a bit easier for students to transition to. And, and for, from the point of view of a student, if you, as, and I was a, a student who at some point uh, was working full-time too. Um, it's, you, it's more flexible in terms of time. So you have to appreciate that um, because people have to work to pay for education. That's, that's just it. Um, and we have some people in the chat. For sure. Um, okay, so do you want me to read them out or? No, so, so Ashini and, and Shannon, I agree with you. So um, I, I did take the care in all my courses to have synchronous time, definitely. I always recorded the sessions, so, but, but yes, I completely agree because it marks a moment in the week that you know it's for that and it helps, it helps structure everything around. I, I think that's very important. The other thing that I thought it was really important and, and I'm, I'm doing is, is that there's still a class environment. So you work with teams or with, you work with others, and I think the students in my in my courses actually uh, made friends. You know, it's it, they thought, oh, online, not going to meet anyone, but they did because you know it was the way the course was designed. They had to work with others. So, yeah. Sure. I'm just gonna switch gears a little bit, and we're gonna just kind of take us through your academic journey. So, yeah. for those that don't know, Dr. Silva is is very reputable earning her BA at the University of Lisbon, the BSc at the Technical University of Lisbon, uh, MSc at Erasmus Mundus Master, Catholic University of somewhere in Belgium, I apologize for my pronunciation, and her PhD at Loughborough. Yes, um, okay. So can I share my screen again? And, and the screen is, I don't want to ramble, so it does help me um, and um, I'll provide some visuals for you. Um, so, so <clears throat> I'm trying to understand what's what is it that I can say that is minimally useful for students. Okay, and the first thing that I have to say is that the culture and the educational system in Portugal is quite different from what is in what exists in North America. Um, and I'm 
uh, in, in specifically in Canada, which I'm still learning how it is, but I, I came to understand a few things already. So, you know, um, from a very young age, I think there's something important about me, which is um, I would say that uh, socially I'm from a working class background. What that means was um, uh, my father was a, a worker at the Portuguese railway. Um, he wasn't a, he had a management job, but he was the only person uh, kind of earning for a family of five. So, you know, we had, we had just enough. Um, and so I didn't have a, an easy kind of, um, all the conditions to do well in, in school. You know, I think we did not have a lot of money. Um, but from a young age, I loved school. I just, I just remember so well being a very, uh, from very um, young age, like five, I mean, when did I go to school? Was it six? I think it was six the first year. I just loved it. I just, I was always excited about learning. Um, and so I always thought I'm going to be a teacher. And that was, that was something that always grew up with me, a teacher, a uh, teacher of, of some kind. Um, yeah. And so I think there are characteristics, personality characteristics that drive you to some professions. And for me, I just, I just love learning. I love learning the books and I love people. I'm fascinated. I can stay for hours just looking at people in a coffee shop, just seeing how they speak. And sometimes it's actually a bit um, <laughs> awkward because I can actually stare, <laughs> stay for a while staring because I just, I just like to know how people function. How do they relate? How they speak? Why do they do this? Why do they do that? I, so, so that was always there. Um, in terms of, you know, uh, my education, I have a very unusual trajectory. So I did a degree in language and literature. So that was my first profession. I was a Portuguese language teacher in high school, the equivalent to an English teacher here, right? Um, and, and my uh, undergraduate degree at that time, they were long. You know, we, we were not for year, four years. Four years here is, is actually good. In Europe, you can have an undergraduate degree in three years. Um, so, and, and so I was teaching um, Portuguese in, in high school and I felt, I felt unhappy. I was kind of waking up and ah, I don't really want to wake up. And one day I thought I can live my life not wanting to wake up. That's too sad. And so, I had conversations with colleagues and somebody just told me, why don't you do another course, another degree? Um, we call it courses, course. So that's, that's the confusion there. Um, and so um, I had been a volleyball player. Uh, I wanted to show you my school, my high school. So the high school, I spent so many hours, you can't see, but this is a net. So I would skip classes, oh, some classes. And then I would tell my father that I arrived late. There was, that was why I was, I had some, you know, some uh, calls in my um, attendance sheet. But anyway, I spent a lot of hours just playing stuff informally, which is something that I don't know whether you do anymore growing up, just playing with other people. So many hours of foot soccer, I wasn't very good at, but um, yeah, we had the spaces. And so I played mainly basketball and volleyball. This is to say that um, then it was a natural process to become a volleyball player when I was 16, I started coaching. So as I was going through university, I was also developing a sporting career. So this is to explain that um, I decided to do a degree in sports and I was already a little bit old. My colleagues, they were nine, uh, 18 and they used to call me old lady <laughs> because I was 27. So I was 27 when I far, uh, first started at, at that degree. Um, it was only a bit problematic. We had all the practical disciplines. So I had to do gymnastics and that was the difficult one actually being, the, being a little bit older. It was not easy for me to do some of the movements I was dreadful at judo and other things, but you know, just just uh, 
just learning. Uh, so I did that and went back to school to be a PE teacher, right? Um, then I realized I just love learning. And uh, this, we are talking about public school. I don't know how it is in Canada, but I imagine public school is difficult here as well. You know, lots of different social backgrounds, you know, sometimes big classes, difficult students. It was very hard. So I decided I'm going to study more, left everything behind. I'm going to find somewhere um, where I can learn more. And during my PE and sport degree, I became really um, upset about, with the fact that there's a lot of people who would benefit from physical activity, sport and movement that we were not talking about. And those are older people, uh, older um, citizens, um, people with impairments and disabilities. And we were talking about high performance, um, you know, general population. And I wanted to teach the people who are, I wanted to work for the people who were normally excluded. So I found a master in, um, it's not written there, oh, it is in adaptive physical activity. So I, I need, I need to, I want to, to do more. Um, and so that Erasmus Mundus master was very special. It, it was one year, but in one year, uh, we had part of the teaching in Belgium, part of the teaching in Norway. And then I also spent three months in Stellenbosch, South Africa. And I was in a group, uh, in a class with lots of people from other nationalities. Uh, yeah, it's just, just a great a life experience, really. Um, then um, there, I kind of uh, got really passionate about social cultural studies, which kind of connect my two previous degrees. And I decided to, I want to know what sport movement, all these movement cultures can do for people who are usually excluded. So I managed to find a way to um, chase a PhD degree. And um, this was not, this was not easy. I did not basically have money for any of this. I don't know how I did it. I just basically, I always have this thing. I'm, you know, it's not money that is going to detract me from doing anything, but you know, it, it was, um, it was a challenge, uh, but I got a scholarship from Portuguese, uh, from the Portuguese government, a foundation to um, do my PhD for, for five years in, in I think it's number one in sport um, in the world. Um, yeah, and I did my PhD in sitting volleyball, the culture of sitting volleyball in, um, in the UK. And I think I'm going to stop here. Then I had some other jobs, but I, I want to, give, to pause to give you a chance. Very impressive journey. I, I think it, it, it really does speak that, you know, if there's a, a will, there's a way. Right, it's not always, you know, if you want something, you can definitely go out and get it. And I think your journey definitely speaks to that, and you know, finding your passion and staying true to that. Yes, um, I guess I guess I had a few sentences there. I, I do like, I think I like to preach a little bit, to be honest. Um, it's just things that throughout my life I've learned. And when I look at how I overcame challenges, and there were many going through these degrees, you know, without, without having financial capacity, was really that idea that if I want, I will. Now, you have, to, you have to be aware that it might take a long time, more than you want. It might take more effort, might take um, more effort, but, but uh, I always had this belief. Yeah, and I think that's how I kind of, um, went forward. The other thing was I never I that I want to tell students because I know this is a, an important issue for you. I did not know what I wanted. As you can see, does that make sense? Because I tried this. Oh, I don't like this. Then I go there. Oh, I don't like that. I just it just happened naturally. And I think the most decisive thing was really passion for stuff. And then I chased that chased that passion. What I see in students these days. You get so anxious. I, I, if, if you don't know what you want to be, it's like there's something wrong with you. 
And the reason I spend a bit of time, you know, telling you about my life, it's not narcissistic, is so that you can see that not everybody had it sorted out. I never planned to be a professor, if that makes sense. It's just, it's just happened because I chased my passion and my interest. Um, fundamental for me as well, and Marcus knows this well because he did the sports coaching course. It's fun. I had fun. I, I, you know, I did not, I don't think we should do things that bring us down, you know, chase the fun. And so that's how I went from place to place. And it was not planned. Yeah. I think that that's, that's very different than what the, the culture is today. You know, there, there's so much, as a student, there's so much pressure, at least within the, the cultural environment around you and being at Western that you have to have a plan after undergrad. And if you don't, you know, you're going, I'm going into fourth year. And is that my plan finalized? No. And I'm not the only one. Like there are tons of students, even in their fourth year and third year and underneath that who don't have it all planned out. But the, the there's this, this stigma that you have to have it figured out. You have to have it all planned out. You have to know what you want to do, where you want to be, where you're going to go. You need to have all those answers to those questions. And in my opinion, it adds a bit of unnecessary pressure and, and stress to the way students go about their, their academic experience in undergrad, because they're, they're, they're so focused on, you know, the academic side of things and marks and grades, as opposed to, you know, actually understanding the types of things that they're, they're drawn to or they gravitate to. Marcus, I think you're making a very important point. Throughout this journey, I got to understand what I liked, what I didn't like. And, and when you do a course, a specific course that you don't like, that information is really important, right? Is restricting uh, a little bit your, your options. And sometimes it's the only way to do it. You, you don't know whether you're passionate about an area because you know nothing about it. So, so that, that is important. I think that should be a very important function of undergraduate to kind of define the areas that you think uh, resonate more with you as, you know, as a person, even if you don't know very well who you are, which is also common, you know, and with age, it, it becomes clearer. So, so that's really important. But I have a question for you and maybe for others. Why do you have to have all the answers? Where do you think that comes from? Is it your parents or is it others? What is, why do you say you have to know what's coming next? Where does that think... come from? I think part of that may be a bit of a parental background influence as well, coming from an, an immigrant household. I think there, there's definitely a bit of that pressure to, you know, if your parents are going to leave a, a third world country and come here to give you a, a better education or a better opportunity at a brighter future, you, you've got to take the opportunity and, and try to, you know, maximize it. And I think that's, that's just one part of it. And then, you know, you combine a bunch of these students from you know immigrant households or things like that and that pressure just kind of amplifies right and it just kind of it just kind of boils into the this cauldron of what am I going to do after undergrad kind of thing yeah yeah it's 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 so understandable because it's understandable and it depends on family background and so on and I think a bit of balance here is I, I my trajectory was um, risky, okay? And I did it because I did not have children. So there were difficult times financially, but it was just me that I was hurting, if that makes sense. So, so if people have different circumstances and I don't want to judge, but I think it's a nice balance between having an idea of what you want to do, but don't let that be so obsessive and so fixed that you don't, that you're not attentive to the, you know, the amazing kind of exciting things that you are learning about. And, and throughout your uh, undergraduate degree, the clubs, you know, this club and knowing other people. And, and I don't know, just, just I, I, I always, and I still have that, I want to grab the world with my two hands and we can't. But having that kind of personality, it just makes you excited about life. I think, yeah, balance between having a plan but still be open to, you know, what happens and what comes and all of 
For sure. And I think, I think similar to that is, you know, also looking beyond the great you get in a course as well, right? Like it, it's very easy to, you know, you got to get a 90 or you got to get an 80 or whatever it is you got to get. But oftentimes it, people kind of focus on, you know, that aspect of it, as opposed to, you know, you can go through a course and get a 90 and not learn anything, but you can also get like a 65 and learn a lot more than that 65 represents. So I also think it's a bit of balance between that as well too, right? Yes, and and uh, and it would be great to have some comments in the chat to see how other people situate in this in this discussion. Whether this discussion is something that resonates with you, I would say what I've learned, and we had a, I think you had a question planned about the differences between the other countries and Western. What I've learned is this is this is actually the cultural. Um, it's a cultural uh, trait. I think um, people are competitive in Europe, you know, all the places that I've been, I've never seen anything like here. Or the students who come to Western are so selected already to get in that you get people who are, you know, extremely focused on grades. Uh, I do think it's cultural though, because, um, you know, there's, there's, I watched a lot, I learned English by watching television. So some of my mistakes come from there. Um, and what I've what I've seen in the movies, they say movies, is, is there's always a prize, an award. You have to have awards, you have to win. You can't, you almost don't do anything if there's not an award. <laughs> it's like, oh my goodness, just have fun and relax. Does, does that, am I, do you think that makes sense? For sure, for sure. I think, I think it definitely, you know, speaks to the environment, the student environment here. So that kind of leads into my next question, which is how do you think the, the student professor relationship differs from, you know, Western to the other, you know, broader parts of the world that you've been to? Um, I'm also seeing the comment in the chat and I'll go there after I answer your question. Okay. Uh, deep speak, deep time. Um, so how does the relationship student professor? So I am not sure. I've been at Western for the last two years and um, been working really hard. I actually don't have too much time to look beyond what are my immediate functions, but I have some, you know, some, maybe some comments. Um, I think the comparison is easier to make with my, uh, trajectory in Portugal as a student. And there's something that is structurally different, which is the education that I had in Portugal. And the reason I did all those courses was because it was free, <laughs> which is something uh, unimagined. Uh, help me here, Marcus, unimaginable. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's, uh, it was free. And, and so um, we did not have such big classes. As, as, as I see here. So, so there are some structural issues like the big classes, um, which really shape what that relationship. You know, the relationship is based, uh, is shaped by uh, structural factors and then factors related to the, the professor as well. But the structural ones are important. So if you have big classes of 400, 500 students, what can you do in terms of the student professor relationship is, is very difficult. Um, and so I think that is a main difference, but I don't put the blame on professors as much. I think there, there are structural differences. I had something else that just finished. Um, oh, yes. And the other part is this competitive culture. You know, it's a very toxic environment. Um, I always tell my students, I don't like grading. That's not how I see people. I, I don't know which grade did you have, Marcus, in the course. I just, it's not, it's something I have to do. And I would change it to something different. But to, for that change to happen, you would have to change all the system before, <laughs> you know? Um, and so I'm not answering your question explicitly because I don't think I can, um, draw a very explicit comparisons, okay? 
Uh, so this is to say that I think in Portugal, because these conditions are different, we could have a closer relationship with the professor, with our colleagues, mainly because it was um, smaller classes and the grade was important, but not to the extent I see it here, especially if you want to um, enter medical school. I think that's medical school, physiotherapy, you know, the, the, the schools that the men I grade. So, you know, it's, it's understandable. Yeah. Sure. And, and sorry, just to, just to go back a little bit. Um, I also think that the, we, we talked about the structure and I think, you know, we talked about this whole big system and how it's not just one class can only look at, you know, learning, but the entire system is focused on grades. And I think going back and like, if you go back in history, it, it's always been about, you know, the people that get the, the higher grades or the better grades get into, you know, better schools and they end up making, they get into better jobs and they make more money. And that kind of falls into that whole stem of stability, right? So yes. I yes. guess in terms of yeah, the structure, it's just, it's always been very focused on, you know, those that get good grades, as opposed to those that, you know, focus on what they're learning will get better paying jobs. Um, and that speaks to the comment from uh, Depthy. Um, I apologize if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly. And you can turn on your cameras and you can speak too, um, but you don't have to. Um, where uh, there's a comment focus on, there's a, a, an emphasis on stability. And so there's that assumption, Marcus, that if you get good grades, you'll get better opportunities. I think that is an assumption that has not been fully proved, if that makes sense. It's, it's, it's a belief, uh, but you need, you know, there are two things there. I believe that if you focus on learning, your initial years might not be as great, but actually when you develop your understanding, that will pay off. You will end up have, having better grades. Okay, this is my assumption and belief, and I don't know how to prove it. Well, it happened with me. My first year in my degrees was the worst. And, and when you start understanding you know, strategies and what professors want, then you get better grades, but also you, you learn and you use that learning. Sure. And the other thing is, I think uh, even for the medical profession, people are, are looking more and more for other skills rather than just the ability to memorize stuff and replicate it back, right? So interpersonal skills, empathy, communication, general, yeah, interpersonal relationship, general manner, you know, uh, can you collaborate with others in a non-aggressive way? So I would say that I'm not sure if that belief, which is shared by, I think, a lot of people, most people, I'm not sure if that is necessarily true. But I understand. I understand why you think like that. Yes. I think it, I think it also kind of goes with the competitive culture, right? Um, yeah. That whole idea of just having to be at the top to get the better opportunity. I think that that's part of it as well. But for sure, there, there are many other ways to go about that. And I think Aside from the focus of just getting good grades, you can also, you know, learn and get good grades as well, right? And, and finding your passion and get good grades as well. So there's also that, that kind of double side to it, I guess. I've, that... I've seen some students who can do it all. Yes. For sure. Um, so we're just going to kind of switch gears a bit and dive into a bit more of your research. And um, I just want to start off with of your, your many research projects, which one did you enjoy the most? Yes, so I was ready for that one. <laughs> so I have a slide, um, just with a few pictures, if you give me, uh, yeah, it's there, no, okay. Okay, so um, I do have a bit of a mixture of pictures here. These are obviously, this, this was my element. I loved beach volleyball. This is a sort of a tournament. Um, and I was, um, this was actually 92. Oh gosh, I'm there somewhere. It was a long time ago. Uh, one of my teams, we traveled to, to Azores, to one of the islands to compete. Um, so, but this relates to my biggest research project, um, which was my PhD. So. So I had 
the unusual conditions, um, the possibility, the opportunities to spend three years researching a specific movement culture. Uh, so I did an ethnography. Don't know if you know what ethnography means, but I can explain quickly. Ethnography is where you spend time in the culture you are researching. So it started uh, when imperialistic countries like Portugal, the UK, went to other areas of the globe and they started colonizing those areas. So I, they wanted to understand more about the cultures of the people who live there. So the original ethnographies were about understanding different people. Um, you, you still have that sort of more traditional research, uh, tribes in the Amazons, tribes in Africa. But ethnography now is used by many researchers. You, you have um, some sort of a community of people, a specific culture, and you spend time with them just to describe and, and, and to understand what are the values, how they work, what is the meaning of, of that culture. So that's what I did for three years. Um, I was very fortunate. So I used my background, you know, one of those synchronicities. I knew how to play, not extremely well, but kind of okay. Um, the, I was lucky that the coach of the volleyball team at Loughborough was the main coach for the women's team, the women's GB team. So he kind of liked uh, my experience and so on. And so I, I helped uh, a little bit coaching GB women's team and I got involved in many different events. Um, yeah, that was my research project, understanding the culture of sitting volleyball, uh, which was composed by people with disabilities, without disabilities. I was interested in understanding how sharing a specific sport could actually bring people together and diminish the, 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 the perception of difference between people with and without impairments. Yeah. For sure. So have you, I know, I know Western has a program specifically about this, uh, the unified program, but in your years at Western, have you, have you kind of brought that experience into organizations in, in Canada? Like, have you, have you brought that research knowledge over is kind of where I'm going with that? Yes. So, so I work closely with um, my research partner, Dr. David Howe, who's also teaching in the School of Sport, um, kinesiology school, sorry. Um, and, um, and so the work that we've been developing over the years, uh, we are now diverging a little bit to the area of movement cultures in relation to um, learning disabilities, which is, I don't consider myself an expert, far, far from that, I'm learning too. Um, but the idea is the same, is to study the culture, how do people relate, what's the impact of participating in, in these cultures, activities, um, in terms of their quality of life and in terms of the perception of disability and impairment um, in general. So we are continuing that work um, during the last year. So, but much of the work that I like doing is actually being involved in the community as this case. And so, you know, within the last year, it, that has been, that has not been possible. Um, but research has so many different aspects to it. So we actually need to read a lot. And, and so this period of time, we can read more, see other projects, see what's the state of the knowledge um, about the cultures we want to investigate. So it's a little bit in the, in the, we have some work going on, but we are also planning and, and learning, which is essential to research. For sure. So what is, what is the biggest thing that you've learned so far um, doing research or, you know, exploring the, the intersection of disability and sport? What, what is the biggest thing that you've discovered? Um, we have this general, that's a, an excellent question. 
And I was not prepared for that, Marcus, but it is, you know, because sometimes we think we researchers or we, we are so Im immersed in our own thing that we forget the obvious questions. You know, it's kind of, oh, everybody knows what's, but, but it's not. So that's a really good question. So kind of what's the greatest discovery from the, the work? Um, you know how we have this assumption that disability sport is, or anything that relates to movement and sport is inherently inclusive. You know, you do something with sport, everybody will get together and connect. That's a bit of a lie. <laughs> That's an important discovery it's because sport tends to replicate movement cultures they do replicate wider cultures. So as an example, in sitting volleyball, the type of impairment you had mattered. So if you were an amputee, you had perfect conditions for the sport because if you are lacking one of, especially lower limbs, if you are lacking one or two legs, you will move very fast, right? That's, that's very good. But you, if you have something that is neurological, and so your um, 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 balance between coordination, that's the word I was looking for, sorry. If your coordination is affected, your status within the culture will diminish. Does that make sense? So, so it, it, it sport itself is so competitive that people tend to rank themselves the criteria, uh, according to the criteria of who is a good player. And who is a good player is the person who does the points, right? There's not a lot there. So, so I guess that that's important. Sport is not inherently inclusive. We have to make it inclusive. We have to be intentional, you know, and, and you're, you have experience and this society is about learning impairments and you're deeply involved in activities that relate to learning impairment. You have to worry, you have to design the environment. You have to, educate people involved to make it inclusive. It does not happen naturally because sport is exclusionary. It's almost against the nature of, of the culture. However, I have to say another important discovery is it can happen. It does happen that people get closer together, that people change the way they think about disability. Uh, it does happen but it's not it doesn't come naturally you know it it's it depends on specific conditions that have to be um, thought of intentionally so would you say that education is i guess the biggest factor that would need to be to be i guess attacked in in terms of getting sport to be more accessible is, is education the number one thing we need to focus on more um, yes, education, being reflective or reflexive too. Um, and the students don't like when I, you know, all my assignments, oh, reflect on this. And they go, oh, because they want me to tell them something that they can then show me they've learned, but they haven't, they've memorized stuff. So when I say reflect is you do something, right? You, you um, facilitate an activity. Pay attention to the people, to their reactions, to how they engage. Pay attention to the implications of how, what, and how you implemented the activity. Okay, it's not to pay attention to say, oh, you know, I suck at this. I'm a terrible coach. That's not it. It's, it's through the process of reflection that you learn and, and develop. So you're right, education, but education does not always mean formal if that makes sense, it's, it's, a, it's a mindset. It's every single thing you do, you pay attention to how it's received, to the implications. And then you reflect a little bit, okay, what did go well? Did it have the effect that I wanted? Um, and so in sport, I'm not sure if the culture is prepared because there's again, hierarchical structures. The coach says what it is and the other people do it. And, and so this is a, it's a mindset. It's, it's so important to develop in everything you do. If you're a doctor, that will be the same. You know, just not assume that you know it all. You have to be constantly um, appraise what you do 
uh, get feedback, get feedback, which is extremely hard, especially for all of us. And I would say, especially for people who grew up in a very competitive environment <laughs> where you are used to say, oh, you're brilliant, Marcus. If I say one day, Marcus, you you know, this is good, but it feels like oh, a knife, you know, right? We are so bad at, get, and, and, and I speak, you know, it's uh, professors get feedback from students. And I go from being the worst ever to being the best ever. And so I, I'm dealing with it, you know, it's just the way it is. But we are bad at receiving feedback. And without that, we don't, we don't get this better. Does that make sense? We just continue to do the same mistakes and the same good things but we don't know why, we don't know. I, I don't understand that we do things without knowing why. And I think that's one of the reasons that, um, that I'm you know, relatively successful in that I got the job as a professor, right? Is that I want to know why. I don't just simply do. You know, if I do something, why? <laughs> why am I doing this? And that is self-learning, self, uh, self-appraisal, self-evaluation, reflection and formal education too, yeah. For sure, I think it's, it's definitely, you know, a mixture of what you, you learn from the textbooks, well, what's, what's in the books and, and crossing that with, what do you actually know? What, what's the, the experiential basis for, for adapting to what you're going to do? And I think at, at the intersection of those two things is where, you know, we can look to, to making sport a bit more accommodating and, and accessible for, for everyone, you know, taking down those barriers, for sure, pardon me. Yes, I think you're absolutely right. I was trying to see where I have my notes of really important things I wanted to say today. And I think you, you just said it, when you're going through your courses and you are, there's a difference between taking a course and actually engaging in the course and actually creating it. I always tell, I try to tell my students, we're creating this together. I don't know exactly everything you're going to learn because there are parts that are unpredictable and that's just the way it is. It's not because I'm terrible, which I can admit I'm terrible at some things, but, but not in that one. It's because learning is unpredictable. And so I would say, Marcus, as you said, you have to read the textbooks and always related to your personal experience. Definitely, that's, that's a great point. You know, does this make sense to what I know? Does this make sense to my experience? And how, if it makes sense, how can I translate it into being a better professional or a better student or a better wherever? Because we should be better. You know, we shouldn't live just being the same or worse. <laughs> we, should, <laughs> we should be better. And without awareness, you don't get better. You know, you just put your hand under the, the sand, like the animal, and you, you don't know what's going on. It's not, not great. I don't want to, I don't want to keep everyone too long, but um, just to, to kind of summarize, uh, in, in all of your experience and, you know, your knowledge, what would you, what advice would you give to your undergraduate self or fellow undergraduate students such as myself? Oh, I was not prepared for that. And also I'm not sure, you know, I'm, I'm humble. I, I, when, you, when you start reading a bit more and reflecting, you know, the more you know, the less you know. Okay, you just realize how ignorant you are, the amount of things you don't know. But thank you for that. In terms of life experience, I'm almost 50. So, you know, and, and I lived a lot, definitely. What would I say to my undergraduate self? I would say, relax, explore, which I did, have fun, and um, trust that things will, you know, I, I want, I want to um, share a message of balance, okay? I do think my trajectory was risky. I don't necessarily say, oh, just do whatever you feel like every day, <laughs> you know, there has to be some sort of idea and general plan, but, uh, but relax a bit more. I think I feel for the students here, I find the environment toxic. I find that you put a lot of pressure on yourselves and, and develop a very strong, I would even call it spiritual, not religious, but just this, this understanding that things will work out. You know, it's, it's kind of a spiritual core belief, which 
you know, you can say, oh, the universe is with me, you can call it God, you can, it's kind of real, ease a little bit more into your, into your experience and let the fun and the passion kind of guide you a little bit. Yeah. For sure. Um, does, and I'm just going to open up the floor here. Does anyone have any questions as we, we wrap up today? So, so I do have something at 515. Um, and, um, but I, I'm fine to stay for until 10 past five. If there's questions, I would love to have some dialogue. Please, or not, <laughs> you know, you don't have to, but um, I do like to talk about these things, kind of, how do we navigate life? It, it, it's tough at when 20 years old, it is, it is quite difficult. There's a lot of angst, I remember that. Yeah, for sure. Um, just just going back to the the atmosphere we're talking about in in you know Western culture. In addition to being, I guess, relaxed and just trying to enjoy the the journey as opposed to the destination. What other pieces of advice do you have for for us students? I think we touched upon some of those. Um, engage in the courses, not take it passively. You know, always do that reflection. Why am I learning this? And you can actually ask your professor. I try to preempt those questions, but it's perfectly fine. And you have to be, you can, you should not be confrontational <laughs> when you do that, but you can ask, why is this important? Um, and then try to find your why I like this idea of why, because it's a good motivation. If you don't have a reason why you do something, it's going, or you're going to do it just because you have to do it. And that's not going to be neither fun nor meaningful. So work on the why. And, and even if something is boring, but you know why you're doing it, it's going to be a different experience. Make it a game. You know, I think it's, it's kind of, how I try to tackle things I don't want to do. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think if we could relate this, you know, apply this, this notion of follow your why, you know, to your journey. I think one of the biggest things, you know, having traveled from, you know, multiple schools or various degrees, I think, you know, focusing, the degrees were never or weren't really, you know, an end goal for you. It was more so just trying to learn as much as you can and again, just following your your why, right? Like your passion. So I, I think that also, you know, you kind of back this up. You know, it's mm -hmm. not just the degrees and oh. you know the certificates. It, it's it's yeah. the the my why, camera the doesn't the camera doesn't let me show you. But if I showed you my office, there's no diplomas there. You know, and I'm I don't normally share. You know, all the bits of paper that says I've done that because you're right. Uh, it's it's exactly that. It's not, um, I know some people take special pride in being called doctor, they so I couldn't care less. I mean, uh, you know, there's, there's, I do it with students so that we understand, trying to do it a bit more, so that we understand there are specific responsibilities and functions attached to my role as a professor that we cannot forget. You know, it's just the structure. But other than that, you're right. It was never, for me, it was never about, oh, look, yeah, you know, I. I'm a doctor or this or that. I did not want to go to my doctor graduation, but my mom made me go. <laughs> <laughs> so, because, because you're right, it was not about that for me. Yeah. I think, you know, I think our, our prof cast today has been pretty motivational and pretty inspirational throughout. So I, uh, again, just want to thank you, Dr. Silva for coming out. It's been, it's been an honor to catch up and I wish you the best from here on out. Thank you. It was great, great to speak to you. And uh, yeah, I love these opportunities because I try to not do too much of this in class, a little bit here and there, um, because I, you know, being a professor has many different dimensions and you're a researcher, but you're also a teacher. And I, I, I'm teaching. I think, I think I try to teach, not you know, not just lecture. And so it's part of teaching and trying to help you with a little bit of my experience. But then I would say, you have to take things that other people say with a pinch of salt, including myself. You know, you have to see what 
part of this conversation resonates with you and put all the other bits in the rubbish because, because you are the main responsible for your journey. And so you don't want to reach the age of 50 and say, oh, I've done this because, and, and I know the parents are a big, um, you know, big part of the equation, but you don't want to live your life just because your parents, just make sure your parents don't see this, please. But, uh, but it's just, you know, one day you're a bit older and your decisions are your decisions. So take advice, but then filter it. For sure. Um, I'm just going to open up the floor one last time. Does anyone have any questions? And um, if not, we will... Don't be shy. What's going on? But yes, I, I would just like to thank you, Carla, for coming out. It's, it's been an, an honor. And I should have said this earlier at the beginning, but uh, this this uh, Craftcast is recorded. It, it is recording. So afterwards, it will be posted to uh, LDAC's YouTube channel um, along with the other Craftcast. So if you had to leave early, you can always check it out there. Yes, and I would, if you don't have questions, but you want some, uh, if, if you can leave some feedback, just say, hey, Carla, thank you for wasting one hour of my time <laughs> or something else. Uh, it would be just great to have, uh, you know, hello, you know, I've liked this or I disagree with that. It would just be nice to know that there's people actually listening from my perspective, but I'm also going to uh, write my email address so that um, if you want to have a chat about any of the issues discussed, um, you know, it might not be this week, but we'll try to arrange some time. And it's great, it was, it was great. Really enjoyed it, the opportunity to share a bit of my um, unusual journey. Great, thank you, thank you so much, Carla. Um, I'm gonna end the recording.